All right, welcome everybody to the Rook uh, presentation on storage for Kubernetes. We're happy to be with you here today. I am Travis Nielsen, uh, the Rook maintainer, one of the original creators of Rook. I work for Red Hat. Happy to be here with you today with Alexander. Hey everyone, I'm Alexander, working for Core Technology Sync. I'm also a maintainer of the Rook project. And uh, yeah, we're going to start diving into what Rook is, storage for Kubernetes. And um, yeah, I think we don't necessarily want our customer's data uh, stored on like uh, floppy disk anymore. So why don't we go a step further to the future? We have hard drives, we have SSDs, either by fancy PCI connections or even then NVMe SSDs, flash-based memory, like it's all much, much faster than it was some time ago. And it's not just faster, but it's also so much more capacity that we have with these, well, new, storage types in quotes that we have nowadays um and because of that on how we kind of already started rethinking how we deploy applications with like containers with kubernetes and all the cool new projects around especially at the cncf we have to kind of also move this storage aspect into the new cloud native dimension and as you already kind of like the typical Kubernetes setup have with like at your shipping boat, you know, that's kind of the analogy here. And you have your, well, small kind of management boat, let's call it a management boat, which just takes care of all everything related to Kubernetes from setting up like the basic monitoring stack or to even just deploy your application in the end, like the automation, CI, CD, and that's all great and all, but for example, for storage, um, if you're, especially if you're not in the cloud or in the, like a, where you can just say, hey, give me storage, give me a storage volume for my application. So basically a persistence layer of some sort for your application. You're kind of, kind of having a bad time um, with having storage for your applications. That's where Rook is coming in. So if we kind of see as like a, we have, our applications, our containers running in, well, Kubernetes, keeping it open there, like there's other, like just also a bunch of distributions of uh, Kubernetes out there and you have your storage. So far, even if we not look at Ceph, I know I'm already mentioning some, dropping some names here, but um, even if you just take Ceph here as an example, um, there's always kind of like this gap between how do you plug your storage into Kubernetes. That's one of the great things that we have to mention before we further dive into what Rook is and all, because it's one of the key aspects in the end for you to be able to use storage in form of Kubernetes native objects like persistent volume claims and like storage classes and so on. So what we have, thanks to the community around Kubernetes, the great ecosystem with Kubernetes, the Container Storage Interface, also called CSI. In a nutshell, CSI is basically one interface for the storage backend. So for example, for Ceph and like the container orchestrator, especially again, container orchestrators to implement that a user can easily get a volume of storage for the application. Like if I'm deploying, I know we can argue if that, that's, that's the best case, um, but if you want to deploy a MySQL database or like a WordPress as well, for example, you need some storage. You need some storage, depending on how you deploy it, for like, for example, well, the database files or like the PHP files for the WordPress block. For all that, this CSI interface makes it quite easy for applications, containers to, at least from Kubernetes side, just say, hey, I need 50 gigs of uh, persistent uh, of storage of a volume it's basically you're claiming from kubernetes perspective you're creating a persistent volume claim and that part then talks with the storage in this case in this example we still go on Ceph to say hey please create a volume and with this and this amount of storage and that is also one of the points where rook is coming into rook 
is basically a Ceph operator for Kubernetes. It takes care of automating the deployment, bootstrapping, configuration, and upgrading of a Ceph cluster and the other components of such a Ceph cluster. We'll be going into what a Ceph cluster is in a second. So right now, just bear with me. And your operator will also take care of creating everything needed for storage for PVCs, for persistent volume claims to be consumed or like to be able to be even provisioned. If we take a look at Ceph itself there as a storage platform, we don't just have um, one type of storage. We have several types. They're kind of like the three most common types of storage, which is uh, which are block storage, shared file system, and object storage, S3, and as like the most common, uh, commonly used API to talk with object storage. So Ceph can do all three. And thanks to what Ceph can do, taking that to the Rook project with one of the uh, one of our latest releases of 1.10, uh, latest minor releases 1.10, with over 10,000 uh, GitHub stars, so many container image downloads, so many more contributors on the GitHub project, and the project itself being CNCF graduated. We are happy to help there with the operator for Seth. For anyone that uh, doesn't know about what an operator does, or like an operator basically starts at the top there at observing. The op operator watches either like a custom resource, a custom object, or something. It, like if there are changes, it analyzes those changes and acts upon that. We can kind of draw like a line with like uh, a conductor for like a um, opera or orchestra where a conductor will on the one hand say you need to play quiet or something but the conductor will also if it's still too loud again observe or well hear it in that case analyze or slash understand it and react by hey quieter quieter please or even louder louder basically and it observes a state and makes sure that it's always applied. It is always this desired state. Let's talk about a bit like how Rook accomplishes this in its architecture, how it, uh, how it looks, for example, when it's run on a Kubernetes cluster. This diagram is probably going to look quite overwhelming for anyone that hasn't worked with Ceph. But the main takeaways here are that with these three different types of storage. I and mean, that's again, block storage, file system files, and just call it file, I prefer calling it file system storage, and object storage is all in one Ceph cluster. It's all possible with just one Ceph cluster. The main point is that this complex system from, again, deployment, configuration, upgrading, manage management, and even the components, for example, for like an object storage, if you even want to use objects that you don't have to, if you want to have file system or block storage, that that is what Rook, the Rook Ceph operator is taking care of. Observing the state that you want and taking care to ensure that it's achieved. Again, with CSI being mentioned so much already, we have ways to easily consume the storage. From for block storage using the Ceph CSI RBD driver, Rados block device. Let's just keep it at that. That's for block storage. For file system storage, which is the Ceph CSI CephFS driver, basically, which is well taking care of managing the volumes for file system storage and provisioning them. So you don't have to do really too much. It's not with CSI. But it's worth that it's mentioned here for object storage, for applications to easily go, oh, hey, Kubernetes API, um, or just in general, from, you know, thinking about like everything kind of a service, like, hey, I need one object storage bucket. And through also the bucket provisioner, 
there's some logic which is implemented also from Rook side that it's easy for an application to get an object storage bucket with a correct uh, with a pair of credentials for the application to already immediately start talking with an S3 storage with the bucket and store its data there. Going into a bit more detail than the first diagram we've just seen of like the architecture structure of how it would look if you have a, a Ceph slash Rook Ceph cluster running. All these components in the end are taken care of by the Rook operator through the means of the Kubernetes API so that if anything happens, all the operator does in the end is use the Kubernetes API to make sure that the end state is achieved. And the Rook operator then, for example, will also talk obviously with the Ceph API and create certain um, certain resources, pools, block storage pools, file systems, and configure them there uh, accordingly. As an example for like this desired state, that we uh, some examples for that, we have a custom object. I've hopefully previously mentioned it already a bit. Custom objects is also one of the things an operator in Kubernetes can watch on. And for example, the Rook Ceph operator brings a custom resource called Ceph cluster. It's not, that's not all of them. It's just one that we take as an example here. Even with this small example, we have just a blob of YAML basically, which says, hey, I want a Ceph cluster with this and this version, this and this certain configuration for like where data is uh, stored and so on. And there's even more options that can be set to, for example, say which disks should be used in which server, or even if all servers should be used, or all devices, all disks in the servers. And this is exactly the desired state, which we are talking about in the end. We have the operator watching these resources. And when you create such a resource, or even if it's updated in any way, the operator sees them, for example, oh, there's no Rook Ceph cluster yet. So it would go ahead and start creating everything needed to run a Ceph cluster in Kubernetes and takes care of starting the monitor pods, the mon pods, Ceph mons, the Ceph manager, Ceph OSD. And if you want to have like object services as the RJW component for file system, there's the MDS components and all those things. This is what the operator takes care of. It takes care of talking with Ceph, configuring everything, setting the correct uh, setting parameters and making sure that that is all in sync based on the YAML blob we apply to the Kubernetes API as an object. With that said, Kubernetes and Ceph in the end is great. It's even without Kubernetes, it's great. Don't go me wrong, Ceph folks. Um, but even combined with Kubernetes, it's making everything even greater because with Kubernetes kind of being this abstraction to some degree of our hardware or even your cloud, this whole API ecosystem that Kubernetes has enables the Rook operator to easily run a complex storage system like Ceph. And now, Travis will uh, walk you through some more self storage related features and what features we have worked on in the latest releases. Yeah. Thanks, Alexander, for taking us through the introduction to Rook, what it is, why we're doing it, and how it's useful to you. Yeah, we, we love Rook. We love providing this, this platform so you can have storage in your Kubernetes clusters. So let's talk in more details now, dive into where is Rook more useful? What features do we have? Why would you use it? First of all, how do you deploy it? So you've, you've seen with Alexander's examples already that you know there are some YAML files, you can go create those, uh, specify your desired state. I'll also point out that there are two Helm charts that we have. Uh, one chart will install the operator and all the re related resources. And the second chart will install all of the Rook CRs. So you can create a Rook cluster, uh, you can create the block pools, the set file systems, the set object stores, all of those types of resources for Ceph have uh, these different uh, custom resources. So that's how you basically deploy the cluster. Now there's lots of ways to configure Rook, uh, just, and Alexander showed just a few of those different options. But really, I wanna point out, you can, you can deploy across multiple cluster topologies. You can deploy it where there's only hosts or multiple hosts. You can deploy in a zone topology, or there's a number of other topologies where you can define racks or data centers or uh, however your topology is laid out. And then Ceph will make sure that the 
data is replicated across the cluster in a way that keeps the data safe, uh, reduces the risk of, of data loss. You know, as one zone goes down, the other zones, for example, would still hold the data even if one zone goes down. And this helps Ceph keep the data highly available. And again, you can customize it, whatever your topology may be. Now, most people do run Ceph, I would say, in a bare metal environment, or that's where the main scenario was when we started on the Rook project, because there was no other solution for on-prem uh, storage to really interact or be installed with Kubernetes. There are also scenarios that are common for running Ceph in a cloud environment, where, first of all, you want a consistent storage platform wherever Kubernetes runs. Why should you have to use one platform in one cloud environment or in bare metal? Like, let's just have one storage platform that works consistently. Second, there are shortcomings that cloud providers have had from the beginning, and they still have, like being able to access storage across AZs, or they have slow failover times. And because you want seconds of failover time instead of minutes, you want to be able to have a large number of PVs, perhaps if you have many small volumes or need small volumes for your applications. You know, some storage providers may have a limit of 30 per node, where with with Rook, uh, basically there there is no limit. There's a you can have you know, say a thousand PVs per node. But there is no real limit. It's just, it just comes down to resources. There are also maybe per characteristics of large volumes that you want, where you provision you know, large volumes in the cloud provider, and then Ceph allows you to have smaller volumes on top of those those larger volumes, and your applications don't know the difference. And finally, you know, Ceph monitors and OSDs. They will run in a cloud environment backed by PVCs. So there's no need for direct access to local devices. So it just works seamlessly in those cloud environments. Next scenario commonly used. So some people have Ceph clusters that are already running outside of Kubernetes and they want to connect their Kubernetes applications to those, to that Ceph cluster. And that's a perfectly common and valid scenario where you take the Ceph information from that existing Ceph cluster, the Ceph mons, the Ceph keyring, cluster FSID, a few other items, and then you import those into the Rook cluster and Rook will then configure, basically Rook configures the CSI driver to connect to that Ceph storage to just make it seamlessly work with your Kubernetes applications. And that CSI driver already mentioned, again, it, it has you know, it has many features of standard CSI drivers that you're familiar with. It is very flexible and has many features. So you can support uh, read-write once volumes with Ceph RDB, RBD. CephFS supports read-write many volumes. It does snapshots and clones, volume encryption, volume expansion, ephemeral volumes, and all of the, the features that you would really expect from a a storage platform. And, and this is just uh, a few of the features that it has. Next feature, uh, Alexander's already touched on this. So if you want object storage with an S3 endpoint, Ceph provides that uh, with Ceph RGW. And the way you do this is you define a storage class for your object storage. And you say, wait, storage class is usually just for volumes that you attach to your pod. Well, the way Rook has implemented this, the storage class allows you to provision a bucket with an object bucket claim the operator creates this bucket when you create this claim, which is a very similar pattern to PVCs, but it's for object storage. And it lets you have access to a bucket. A KMS encryption. So you want your data, if you want your data encrypted at rest, KMS encryption allows you to do this. We we support multiple backends for encrypting, storing the encrypted keys. KMS HashiCorp, IBM KeyProtect, uh, KMIP. And we're working on adding support for others so that you can ensure that your data is, is secure and encrypted at rest. Stretch cluster. Uh, so in some scenarios, you really only have two different data centers or two zones where you have storage available. In this configuration, Ceph still needs a third node or a Ceph monitor that uh, acts as the tiebreaker between the two. So this, this third node is needed somewhere else to work with the other two zones, but ultimately the storage is only found in two of the zones. Uh, you've got replicas in each of the two zones to provide greater resiliency. Data mirroring. For any real application that needs to uh, replicate its data, it, it needs to ensure that that data is also available for applications that need to fail over when you know some cluster goes down. Say a whole Kubernetes cluster goes down. If you've mirrored your data to another Kubernetes cluster with Ceph, as long as you've implemented DR for your application, at that level, you can switch it over. You can make your application switch over its active configuration and run completely from the other cluster because the data is mirrored 
over between the, the clusters. All three types of data can be married with Ceph. We've got the block and the file system and object with RGW multi-site, all of those can be mirrored uh, using asynchronous, re asynchronous replication. Again, it's for enabling DR scenarios. You really want resiliency in your applications for disaster recovery. So let's talk about some of the recent features that we've added. Really, in the last few months, 1.9 and 1.10, so we've put some effort into our crew plugin. So this is a tool. It runs outside the operator. You may be familiar with other crew plugins that are available in the community. Uh, so this is one that will help you administer these one-off scenarios in Rook that the operator just doesn't handle uh, directly. So you can do things like print out the status of your cluster. You can show the health of the cluster. If you need to perform really advanced operations on the Ceph, Mons, and OSDs, you can start what's called a debug pod. If you need to get rid of an OSD, you can purge it, and then other simple things like just restart the operator. So we're continuing to uh, improve upon this plugin and add new features. It's really going to help with disaster recovery scenarios again, and things where the operator really just doesn't cover. The operator covers scenarios where it's constantly running and monitoring desired state, but sometimes disasters happen and you need to be able to just run these one-off actions to get the cluster back into a good state when the operator isn't even capable of running, perhaps. So we're excited about that. I hope you can try it out. Give us feedback on what features you'd like to see in the crew plugin. A few months ago, we did a documentation facelift. So we're just happy to have you know, an updated framework with make docs, a new look and feel. It's searchable. We'll continue to add content. And if you have any feedback, we'd love to hear your feedback on the documentation as well. As always, Ceph is making updates to the data layer. And our goal is to continually add support for what Ceph is doing. So we've added support this year for Ceph Quincy. This came out earlier this year. And then support for Ceph Octopus was also dropped by Ceph. It reached end of life. And so now we dropped support for that in Rook. So the latest releases of Ceph Pacific and Quincy are supported in the latest Rook releases. Some of the CSI improvements that we've made in the 1.10 release with the latest CSI driver. So there's KMIP integration for you know, encrypting your volumes RBD volumes for block storage. There's NFS support for snapshots, restore and clone and volume expansion. There's uh, PB and snapshot metadata. So if you want to know more about your PBs, that the metadata is attached to the PBs. There is shallow read-only support uh, without cloning the underlying snapshot. NFS has been a, an area of, of focus for the team as well, adding more support for enterprise NFS features. So you can connect generally from the outside of of the Kubernetes cluster to the Ceph storage inside Kubernetes. For example, adding client ID management via SSSD with LDAP, Kerberos client authentication support. Um, and again, yeah, really supported for external clients for now. And we're, yeah, this is an area of active development. We're looking forward to feedback on how you'd like to use NFS. So a brief thought on roadmap and where we're going with Rook. Uh, again, our goals are always to really support new Kubernetes features when they come out to make sure Ceph is always managed uh, in a very robust and, and thorough way. So we need to support Ceph features when new Ceph features come out. We make sure they're exposed and configurable through Rook in a simple way with CRDs. Finally, we it's always a goal of ours to respond to community input. We wanna know what storage needs you have and how we can improve and just make sure your, your needs are heard. Or as a CNCF graduated project, we really want to make sure we're doing what the community needs, needs to be done. We're here to, to respond and, and hope you feel that response as you come to our, our Slack and GitHub issues and, and other places for feedback. Uh, some of the features areas we're working on, you may have heard of Kazi, the object storage interface for containers. It's going to kind of take the place of OBCs eventually uh, it'll be a while, while out because Kazi is still so new. It's just an alpha in Kubernetes 1.25. So we'll have an implementation of that soon for Rook. Uh, other areas, encryption. So we do have encryption across the wire, for example, but uh, also other types of encryption and other places to store the encryption keys, depending on the, the KMS. We've got disaster recovery scenarios and lots more. There's always more to do in the storage realm. So how to get involved, uh, we hope you can visit the Rook booth at KubeCon while you're here. And if 
you know, visit our book GitHub, visit our book Slack, Twitter, follow us on Twitter. And if you'd like to talk to us uh, and don't find us at the Rook booth, you can join us in our community meetings on a, a bi biweekly basis. We've got a link to that on the, the main Rook GitHub. So we hope to hope to meet you, hope to hear from you. And thank you. It's been good to be with you today. And thanks, Alexander, for all the info on Rook. Thanks as well. And yeah, as Travis already said, we're going to be uh, at the Rook booth. It should be located in, at the CNCF Open Source Pavilion. So if you're at KubeCon and seeing this, be sure to check uh, out the booth. And thanks for listening. <laughs>